Auschwitz I, the worst concentration camp known to man during the Holocaust. Here at Auschwitz, over two million Jews were exterminated by the Nazi regime. Auschwitz I was the place where many experiments on twins took place. In this film, we wish to describe to you the events that took place here at Auschwitz I. We will follow the life of an experimental twin and her life through Auschwitz. We will also explain to you how the Nazis succeeded in killing over two million Jews. A person's life at Auschwitz started even before they were there. They began in a small train car that shipped them to Auschwitz. Over a hundred people would be crammed into these train cars, and many would die before they even reached Auschwitz. At Auschwitz, they would be sorted into groups. The Nazis then decided who shall live and who shall die. By the flick of a thumb, left sent you to the gas chambers, where you would die almost hours after your arrival. And right sent you to the work camps where you might have a chance to survive. The selection platform is important to tell. The, you can't see it very well. You might have to go up to the tower. But between you can see one, two the rows of tracks. This is where all the separation of the families happen, right here. On that little strip, it goes all the way to the wood. After selection, inmates would go to one of two places. Some lucky few were chosen to do forced labor for the Nazis and would be sent to work camps. The rest were then sent to the gas chambers. Auschwitz I contained one gas chamber. This is how it may have worked. I'm standing now by the ruins of the gas chamber and crematorium number two. Well, the first one was in Auschwitz I, a very small one, by the way. <laughs> this is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see tomorrow. The, not the ruins because the gas chamber and crematorium num uh, number one in Office one were not destroyed. But all the gas chamber and crematoria here in Birkenau were completely destroyed, were blown up by the Nazis themselves just a few days before they left, in January 45. Of course, the Nazis did so to uh, obliterate the trace of the crimes. Uh -huh. The Nazis led the victims along that road on the left. You know, and of course, they never told them anything about the extermination here, never. But always something about the shower, these people were supposed to be to take first, before they were, like the Nazis told them, before they were, before the admission to the camp as workers, you know, because the Nazis always told them uh, about the work camps in the east, in the so-called east, and into today's Poland, Ukraine, Belarusia, and the occupied east, of course, by Germans. You know. uh, the Nazis led them along this road on my left, and told them about the shower and quite often they also told them about food. About food and drink, the drinks they were supposed to be given after their shower. You know? Quite many people believed in this idea, especially those from Western Europe. You know? Couldn't have much idea about the Nazi atrocities in the occupied Poland or in Ukraine. You know? Then the Nazis led them this way, sorry. The steps you can see it there. Uh, didn't exist yet. They're all part of the monument. You know? The central part of the monument is there. Monument to the victims of Auschwitz Birkenau. You know? uh, the Nazis led them at first to into the underground changing room there. Maybe we'll come close in the moment, they will sit better. They had to undress in the changing room, all, all of them at one time, meaning men, women, and children together. Uh, the hooks and numbers on the walls there, like in any other changing room. The Nazis told them very often, don't forget your numbers, please, to find your shoes and your clothes after your shower. You know, sometimes they were even given towels and small pieces of soaps, just like for a real shower to deceive them, of course, at the last minutes. You know. If not, if there are not enough towels and soaps for everybody, they at least allowed them, the Nazis, to take their towels uh, and their soaps into the next room, on the left, there. You know. It was the gas chamber itself, a big one, about 200, uh, 200 square meters. Up to 2,000 people, up to 2,000 people, the Nazis crowded there at one time. You know? Sometimes it wasn't enough place for everybody, so the Nazis sometimes uh, took some people out of the complex, out of the uh, gas chamber and crematorium, and shot them outside. You know? 
Sometimes even nine, ten people were standing on each square meter at one time. Uh, the Nazis, after the last, the, uh, the last ones, uh, shower heads attached to the ceiling, as you probably know. You know they, it really looked like a shower room. You know? The walls were painted carefully in white and there were shower heads attached to the ceiling. That's why most of these people, many of them at least, believed that the, it must have been a shower room there. After the last ones finally entered that room, the Nazis suddenly closed and locked a thick door behind them. Uh, just after they, the Nazis locked them there, uh, some uh, Nazi guards, the so-called SS disinfectors, specially trained for this purpose, dropped small crystals, small crystals of the poisonous gas cyclone B, through openings on the ceiling. And as you can see a bit uh, uh, on this plan here, there are four openings, four openings on the ceiling of the gas chamber. You know? The Nazis dropped the crystals of the gas cyclone B and just after they did so, they covered these openings and just waited. The cyclone B, chemically hydrogen cyanide, a very strong poison uh, used here for disinfection and in many other places too, escaped from the crystals inside at once and killed all these people crowded there. All the victims died in the gas chambers um, here from internal suffocation. You know? And the extermination usually didn't last longer than just 10 or 12 minutes. But to be absolutely sure that no one survived this, the gas chambers like number two there were opened only after about half an hour. It was ventilated even earlier. Then, not the Nazis, but the Jewish prisoners called the Zonderkommando prisoners, Zonderkommando means special squad in German, had to remove the corpses of their countrymen. It happened, we know it even the corpse of the relatives and uh, brought them all then upstairs by a big lift to the crematorium behind you. you know? They had to search through the corpses very, very exactly for valuables, for valuables they could find in the corpses like for gold teeth, chains, rings, etc. If they missed anything available in any corpse, they were always killed for this. You know? Usually Nazis killed such on the commander prisons by burning them alive in the ovens. You know? They also had to shave her from heads of murdered women, because the Nazis sold this hair to uh, different German factories. You know? And then, as you probably know, the Germans made um, uh, mattresses, um, carpets, blankets, threads, wigs, etc. etc. Uh, and uh, finally the corpses were burned in this crematorium. There are five big ovens in this crematorium behind you. Five big ovens. You can see it here. On the last photograph on the right. Five big ovens. This, only the ovens of this crematorium could burn about 2,500 corpses daily. The cyclone B was dropped. Well, I don't know, are these the vents that you would call for the cyclone B? And they opened the Get the Zyklon B was dropped in. I think that the room was a little bit taller than that, but I don't know. He said that people would climb on top of one another. See, the gas was rising from the floor. And as it was rising, people were trying to get away from the rising gas. So what happened, the stronger ones ended up on the top. And he said it was a mountain of intermingled bodies. And when the people on the top of the pile stopped moving, he knew that everybody was dead. Along with forced labor, there was also some deadly experiments performed on people. Many of these were performed by the notorious Dr. Mengele. Twins were favorites of these experiments and were tested since there were two exact copies of them. Fortunately for Eva, she was one of the hundred out of a thousand to survive. In these experiments, people were often purposely infected with a disease. The Nazis would then try to find the cure by using unknown chemicals. Many people often died after they were infected with disease and not successfully cured. This is probably what Auschwitz I is most known for. Uh, processed the one of the first brick buildings that we crossed over from the main road building to the right that was the processing center and from there we walked through the this camp and our barrack 
is about the second barrack from the corner. If you are looking at the guard, at the, at the guard tower right there in the corner, I don't know if you can see it from here. The second building from there, of course, is gone now, but that was the site where the barrack was. So it was, we were marching all the way from there to, and it was, at the time, there were a lot of what we saw, a lot of uh, prisoners coming back from the work, and they looked just skin and bones, like walking human skeletons. If you wanted to survive Auschwitz, there is one thing you have to have. That is, the want, the need to live. Just one more day. No more being polite, just survival. This is a very survival, what matters. But we just wanted to live one more day. And um, it was very, very hard. I will tell you that what you saw in the barrack, in the brick barrack, somebody said, oh, that looked nice and warm. Well, what did you think about it? <laughs> not it, nice, not warm. Yeah. No, neither. And it was even worse that time because, yes, there were more bunk beds, but the conditions inside were not much better. Very little heat. How much time did you spend in these barracks each day? Uh, we, in these barracks, on the days where we went for one day, whole day experiment, we spent probably 12 hours. We were gone for about eight hours. And then walking, yeah. And uh, on the other days, we spent here about... Uh, for, so we spent about 20. So we spent a lot of time in these barracks. And only one thing I forgot to tell you, that once a week, on the days when we were going to the blood lab, we would be taken to for shower. And I would be given, all of us were given a bar of soap. And it, it didn't, wasn't sudsing very much, but it was soap and we would be taken to the showers. And I washed with that soap from May of 1944 until May of 1946, when I attended a memorial service to the Holocaust. That was the first memorial service in the city in Romania. And the rabbi said, if anybody had any soap, to please bring it to the memorial service, because it was made out of human fat. There is a lot of debate today that it wasn't. I, do, I believe, and I, as I knew then, I thought it was. It had a very strange, didn't make any salt like regular soap. But the reason we kept it, soap was a very important commodity during the war. But I developed nightmares, and now I lived in Romania. And I could not take shower and use soap for a long time because I developed nightmares every night until we arrived in Israel that I was washing, taking a shower, and the soap turned into the voices of my parents and my oh. sisters. So it was some, and I never told anybody, we didn't have any psychiatry, psychologist, there was no such thing in those days. And I didn't dare, dare tell my sister because I was afraid that she would get nightmares. If she didn't think about it, didn't bother her, I didn't want her to, to suffer. So some of the after effects of the camp kept going on in a very, very severe way in many ways. And even the privation in Romania was tough because it was very poor, didn't have any money, and we were suffering from tremendous malnutrition. Same. Well, my goal was is to beat the Nazis by staying alive. That was your meaning? That was my meaning. I didn't have any big goals in writing down anything. Right. I was... So you had a purpose, you had a purpose. I had a purpose. I also believed that I couldn't do anything else to defeat the Nazis, but somehow to survive when they were gone. Right. And that world of liberation was looming very big in our horizon because by the time we were brought here, a month later, the bombing started. So that was first sign that somebody was trying to free us. The other thing this is also, we would walk out here, come out of the barrack, and when roll call in the morning, we would stand right here and in rows of five, and then they would count us. 
after roll call. Now sometimes we stood for roll call for about half an hour, but sometimes half a day. If somebody escaped the camp, they would keep us until that person was found alive or dead. Even the children, even it made a difference. <laughs> two years doesn't matter. These were some of them were only two years old. And I always would say to my own mind, good luck, good luck. I hope you made it. But what happened when they found them, if they were shot, they would shout, we would have to watch that they were killed. If not, not very far from here was a gallow where they would hang the person, and we had to watch the hanging. So it was a very clear lesson that they were teaching us. Look at that guard tower right there. We could play pick a -boo with the guard. And uh, we did. We, we, some of them we knew, not by name, but by appearance. And uh, when the sirens were going on, the guard emptied so fast and the airplanes would make, would come over the sky, make a yellow, big yellow smoke circle all over the camp in Birkenau. And we always knew that that meant that somebody was trying to free us. And I never heard anybody else talk about the yellow smoke circle. To me, that was so clear. The one airplane came, made a yellow smoke circle, then that airplane disappeared, the Nazis ran for their lives, they turned on the siren, and then the bombers would come. And that increased from July of 1944, when we had only one air raid a, a day, to by November of 1944, when we had four air raids a day, and then all the experiments stopped. So it then, and from there on, the air raid continued day and night until actually liberation. When Auschwitz was liberated in 1945, Eva and all of the other prisoners were lucky to be alive. Their hard determination and work had helped them make it through. Sadly, the rest of their family probably did not survive, and these young children and adults would be left alone. It was snowing so heavily that I couldn't see from here to the other side of that little street. And finally, after about 30 minutes, I could make out some faces. It was dark, very, very dark and snowing heavily. And this is where I saw the Soviet troops entering the camp. I didn't know they were Soviet. Camouflage right raincoat, white raincoat. And they were smiling. So it was, when I say I stood in, on the steps, in Birkenau it makes no sense, but in Auschwitz this is a kind of step, one of these barracks. I have no idea which one I supported. Because I think that even victims can overcome these difficulties and remain human. And I am proud that most of the, none of the Mangala twins ever did anything bad to anybody even though we have lost our families as young children. So that is a message that I think it's important and it needs to be passed out to humanity that you can survive unbelievable difficulties and not become a bitter terrorist as an excuse for what happened to you. Well, I did, how about the letter of forgiveness? And once I realized that this would be a meaningful gift for him, I also realized that was a life-changing so that that came about by wanting to thank somebody you wouldn't really ever want to thank, a Nazi. And it's amazing how that evolved. I mean, I would have never thought that by thanking a Nazi, finding an appropriate gift for a Nazi, I would discover a life-changing event for me. But that, that nobody took care of the camp. People walked in, took anything they wanted for almost 40 years, and then, when we came back, actually in 1985, I told Miriam, my sister, and we have a filming of it, and he, she said, well, where on earth was the barrack? There is no sign of the barrack. So I am going with my feet, looking like that, and Alex says, Mom, what are you doing? Are you looking for gold? I said, no, I'm looking for the foundation. And 
if we can move the snow underneath it, the foundation is right there, the old line of the barrack. Now, Alex, you don't know where you're doing it because you're going, the, I think it's right there where the higher part is. Alex, where the higher part is, you can't eat too much snow. Yeah, so... Um, The camp was left unattended for many years and was not open to the public. Finally, Eva and her sons were able to return to Auschwitz and visit the place where she stayed. It wasn't until 40 years after her experience that Eva found another survivor of Auschwitz. Now, about 1997, I lectured in San Francisco and there was a group of survivors and one of the, and their grandchildren were reading what the survivors had written. And one of the guys said, I escaped from Auschwitz. So I went up to him, I said, finally, I know why I stood for roll calls so many hours. <laughs> <laughs> it took me that long to find somebody who survived. 